Uh, what I want to talk about now is some a uh, few words about uh, portfolio uh, managing the portfolio. So what we looked at in the previous session was uh, structuring deals, and so now we're going to talk a bit about uh, how we manage the portfolio, which is an area of private equity, which is uh, which is extremely important, and it's perhaps the the, um, the least understood of all the of all the areas of private equity, if I may if I, if I may say so. So let's um, let's start by looking at um, a couple of studies that have been made in the in in the sector, and see what insights we might we might gain from these. This was a study here that you can see. It was conducted uh, just a few years ago by Capital Dynamics, which is a a, very, a, a large fund of funds based in London, and uh, Munich University out of out of Germany. And they, they analyzed about 700 successful private equity investments over a period of about 13, about well, 23 years. And they used a technique called value attribution analysis by benchmarking the company's performance against um, some reference uh, quoted companies that, that were there. And what they found was that um, the value creation and the average uh, the value creation was 51% uh, of the value creation in the in the companies so the value creation meaning the increase in the value of the company 51% came from operational improvements in the company 31% came from uh, from leverage so from uh, leveraging the company with debt to increase the equity returns and the rest was accounted for by the multiple expansion by buying the company cheaper and selling it at a higher price and then within that operational, uh, that fifty-one percent of operational improvements, seventy-two percent of that was uh, growth in EBITDA, in profits, and the rest was better management of cash flow through inventory uh, and working capital management. Then that uh, EBITDA growth itself came seventy-three percent from growth in under in the business, in sales, and twenty-four percent from uh, improvement in profitability or margins through management of costs. So if we take 51% and multiply it by 72% and multiply that by 73, we end up with something under 40%. So the biggest part of the value creation of these private equity backed companies was in, in growing their underlying business and not so much in leverage, uh, although leverage was 30%, it was only 30% leverage and only 20% in kind of trading or speculating, meaning buying high, buying low and selling a high price. So a good half of the value creation was from, let's call it non-financial engineering and non-speculative aspects, which would be a strong case for the value of private equity uh, uh, in, in, in successful investments. And they also the average return of this successful sample was uh, forty one percent, and if you take out the effect of leverage, which accounts for thirteen, you're left with a twenty eight percent return, excluding the amplifying effect of leverage. So that's the sort of measure of the operational improvements. And if we look at the um, the benchmark return of the quoted company, that was fourteen percent com compared to the twenty eight percent of the. Uh, the private equity backed company. It was, a, it was a coincidence that it was 14 and 14. And so that means the private equity companies did twice as well as the quoted benchmarks uh, that they had, which would be a strong suggestion that um, private equity backed companies are more successful than, uh, than their counterparts. And then this brings me to um, another study which was done by um, McKinsey and what they did was to try and establish the connection between the company the private equity backed company being successful and the fund manager and they did a similar study well not exactly the same but they took 60 private equity investments and they did the similar analysis and they found that 63 percent of the value creation came from company outperformance and from that they stripped out the effect of financial engineering and the rising tide, meaning the general economic cycle uptick. And so that brings us to the next uh, slide here. And if we look at the conclusions here, we can see that 
they divided these um, the sample of companies into the top third performing companies, uh, the middle third performing companies, and the bottom third uh, performing companies. And if we go and look at the top third performing companies, so the red stri stri stripe, the top third performing companies had the following two uh, key characteristics. The first was that um, during the first hundred days of the investment, the private equity uh, partner, so the senior person in the private equity fund, spent half of his time with the company or dealing with the company during the first hundred days. And if we go to the right, in 100% of the cases, the partner had regular contact with the senior management of the company, meaning meaningful, con significant contact every week. And then if we go and look at the bottom third uh, of the companies, the worst third, you see that during the first 100 days, the partner only spent one-fifth or 20% on average of his time with the company. And uh, on the right-hand side, 55%, they lost touch. They didn't have regular contact with half of the companies in their portfolio. So in this case, this study would suggest that there is a very strong correlation with the company performing well and um, on the one hand and with the time spent by the fund manager both during the first hundred days and in terms of having regular contact with the company um, with the company after. So that's an important conclusion which is suggesting that uh, you know the hands-on involvement of private equity managers is essential uh, to the success of the company. This is um, the third and last study that I'm going to uh, refer to. This was a study that was performed by Bain uh, and Co. in 2014. Bain is a major management consulting group and if we look at the left-hand chart they found that um, 50% of all the fund managers that they surveyed had a clearly defined model for value addition. In other words, only half of all the fund managers actually had a plan of what they were going to do after they made the investment, only half. And then if you look at the right-hand chart, the question is uh, how, how often do you actually uh, execute your plan once you've made the investment? And only, if you look at the red, only about 5% of all fund managers had the discipline to execute their value addition plan all the time. And half of them did it most of the time. And then half of them didn't do it at all, some of the time or not at all. And so we can see um, clearly that, um, you know, you've got here good and bad fund managers because uh, if you look at the left-hand side, only half actually have a, um, a plan of what to do after they make the investment and then only a few, uh, very few of those really have the discipline to, to, to do that plan all the time and some of them do it most of the time and the others don't so that's probably part of the explanation of why you've got you know the top quartile fund managers and you've got the bottom quartile fund managers so that's this study explains it I think quite uh, quite succinctly so let's um Having uh, looked at these three, you know, quite interesting studies about uh, private equity, um, there's not there's not a huge amount of studies on on the private equity sector. They're done from time to time. These are three that I've uh, I've referred to, which were quite well known, groundbreaking studies. But they're not being they're not unfortunately not repeated on an annual basis or anything like that. And so, let's try and uh, establish a framework for why private equity ownership is. Uh, certainly in my opinion the uh, the superior one of the superior models of company ownership why is that why is that the case well it's due to five fa five or six factors which I've listed here the first one is um, the, there is concentration and rationality of ownership in other words the private equity fund will have a, a quite a large block of shares you know 20 percent or more which will give the fund influence and seats on the board and um, the influence may be enhanced by veto rights because what a veto right does, it acts like a turbocharger to your minority state because you've got extra powers. And so we've got concentration of ownership and rationality of ownership because the product the product investor is a rational economic operator who's made a generous to increase the value of the company and improve its profits. Um, the second factor is closeness of ownership. 
And so um, the job of the private equity owner is to get involved, to be on the board, and to have an active approach. So ownership is close. The third factor is building value. The fund manager only gets rewarded if he has an exit at a higher price and he has to have an exit because his fund has a limited life. And so the main, the, the only agenda really of the, um, the private equity owner is to increase the value of the company over a certain period. Fourth, management incentives. The, um, the private equity owner is looking to make sure that management's interests are aligned with his interests by providing them, for example, stock options, as we saw in the example of the options or by uh, developing middle management. Uh, you know, a typical story of what you might get in a growth investment is that the, the private equity investor invests in a company with an entrepreneur who operates a bit like a one-man band, taking all the decisions, and the, the PE owner is trying to encourage the development of a middle management layer underneath the founder. And fifth, action and decisiveness. The PE fund manager has a simple agenda. I mean, it's, it may not be simple to achieve it, but the agenda is simple, I want to uh, increase value, I want to exit, and I'm, I'm rational. And so this, uh, this is an orientation to take quick action because the private equity fund manager is on the clock, he needs to get his exit within a certain period, time passes quickly, and so there is action and there is decisiveness. And so this cocktail of factors, concentration and rationality of ownership, closeness, building value, in set aligning management's interests and action decisiveness it is a powerful cocktail which uh, represents a very strong force uh, which will provide a lot of um, power to the company. If we make a comparison with other models of ownership, let's compare the private equity backed company to a family owned company, to a, a quoted company which is widely held so nobody owns more than one or two percent like a kind of quoted company on the US stock market or a state-owned company, which we might find many in emerging markets. So do ownership concentration in a private equity company, yes. In a family company, yes, the family owns it. A quoted widely held company, yes. There's no, there's no concentration. State-owned company, yes. Is the ownership rational? Private equity, yes. Family company, yes and no. You know, you've got family conflicts, you've got children, it's not always totally rational. Quoted widely held company, yes, it's rational. Um, the, the investors are different. State owned company, a bit, you know, it's political. There may be political agendas, so it's not rational purely economically. Is ownership close? Private equity, yes. Family company, yes. Quoted widely held company, no, the ownership is remote. It's um, some pension fund only 1%. They're not really involved. And state owned companies, no, it's, it's owned by the state who's a remote, who is remote. Is the agenda to build value? Private equity companies, yes. Family company, no, not so much. It's the family lifestyle. It's leading it to the next generation or just growing the company. So it's not so much building value. Quoted widely held company depends, probably not, not so much. It's the economic cycle. State owned company, usually not. It's about owning the company. It's about votes. It's about jobs. Management incentives, the private equity, yes. Family companies, no. Typically, the family company, um, for those managers who are not, family members, they reward loyalty, they're not really using stock options, it's more about loyalty. You don't have to be a genius, but you have to be loyal. Quoted widely held company, depends, state owned company not, it tends to be a fixed salary. And then action and decisiveness, private equity, yes, family companies, no, they're, you know, they're waiting for the next generation. Widely held quoted companies, no, state owned companies, no. So if we score the companies, the private equity backed company scores six out of six. The family company might score two to three out of six. The quoted widely held company, two to three out of six. The state owned company, two out of six. So clearly, if we look at these factors, private equity backed companies score more highly than other models of ownership. And that's, that is an important conclusion because what it means is that a private equity backed company is stronger than other types. And, and in fact, what we're expecting this year is that we're going to be seeing uh, private equity backed companies um, who are going to be acquiring weaker competitors who have weaker ownerships, such as single founders or others, who are going to be net sellers of these private equity uh, pri private equity backed companies whose, uh, whose, uh, whose owners have capital and know how behind them. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the explanations for that. 
if, if we, we um, if we think about where along the value chain uh, you're going to increase the value of a uh, of a private equity backed company, <coughs> we can see where would the value come from. Well, entry, financial engineering, earnings growth, margin expansion, corporate governance, and exit. These are the six categories along which uh, you can create value in a company. Entry simply means, well, I could um, be a good deal maker and I'm able to acquire the company for a low price or a low multiple, and that requires uh, investment banking skills. Financial engineering means that I can uh, leverage the company in order to enhance my equity return, and that requires uh, banking skills. Thirdly, I can increase value. I can create value by increasing the earnings of the company through growing the company organically or doing a kind of bolt-on acquisition of some kind. And that requires more operational skills than uh, financial skills. I can increase the profitability of the company through margin expansion by either repositioning the companies to a higher margin segment, like going upscale, or by um, managing my costs better. And that requires also some kind of operational skills on the part of the fund manager. Fifth, I could improve corporate governance. So I can upgrade the general quality of the company by having audited accounts, uh, making sure the company has uh, got a very good reporting system, everything's fully computerized, and that will require, that will result in an improvement in the quality of the company and then potential buyers of the company will be prepared to pay a higher price or a higher multiple because the company's quality will be higher because they feel better informed. And that requires a kind of uh, consulting, accounting type skills to implement uh, a higher level of corporate governance. And then sixth is exit, that by having uh, being exit driven as a fund manager, we can uh, position the company for a good exit by working on all the key things that we need to work on so that the company represents an attractive exit to somebody. So these are the areas in which I could, I could add value as an investor. So this represents what we could describe as a value, uh, a value addition framework uh, and in what areas uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can add value in the company. And this clearly rela relates to the study we saw earlier of Munich University and Capital Dynamics just as we created here as a, a, a kind of table giving the, uh, as a kind of framework for value addition. Um, we talked earlier about the um, study that had been made by Bain about whether any um, private equity investor actually has, um, has, him, has as such a plan for how to develop the company. And here, is my, here are three examples of how a private equity investor might have a plan, a pre-packaged plan, a pre-prepared plan for the level of his involvement with a portfolio company. And so here I'm showing three models of involvement, a basic model, a medium model, and a high model. So the basic model, my commitment, what's my commitment to the portfolio company? Well, I will... I will attend meetings of the company's board of directors. If the company uh, has, needs some help, I will respond to email requests from the company saying, could you give me an introduction to here? Or what do you think about that? So I'll respond to a reasonable level from company email requests for assistance. And thirdly, we'll have a meeting every quarter, every three months to, for half a day or so to discuss strategy with the top management. And that could be that could represent a basic involvement in the company's life by the fund manager. Then we get to we step it up a notch, and we have our medium involvement plan. And here we have monthly strategy meetings with the company. We uh, we actually instead of just responding to emails, we actually show up and attend occasional meetings with potential customers or investors or partners or suppliers to the company to show our to fly the flag and support the management uh, or key employees uh, who may, we may help to interview. So here we're stepping up our involvement in terms of our time commitment. And then we step it up a notch beyond that and we have the, the high involvement model and here we're really getting involved with the company. We have, a, we have strategy sessions with the management twice a month for half a day. 
we go on a corporate retreat for two days. We go somewhere, you know, in the desert, and we sit down in the in a hotel and talk about strategy for two days. And, and we may send one of our junior team members to help out in the company, maybe full time for two, three months, or we go send them there, you know, two days a week or something like that, providing some kind of support. And so, what what we can do here is. Um, these are sort of generic examples of three levels of plan and each fund may develop their own version of these but what we might do is that we say well we've made this investment now this company here it's um, you know it's a straightforward investment there's no particular problems so I'm going to spend you know I'm going to spend 40% of my time on the company the first hundred days and then we're going to have our basic involvement so I'll, we'll go to board meetings and then um, meet every three, four times a year to have a longer discussion and that's fine, that's all we need to do. And on, we may have a company where we've bought the company but it's got some issues, but a lot of potential. We do the high involvement and says, oh look, we've got a, this company's got a few issues, we, we really need to get stuck in. So let's send one of our juniors there full time to see what's going on and let's meet the management twice a month and really spend time with them because that's what they need. So for every portfolio company, you know, you may be a fund manager and you've got a portfolio of 10 companies and you know you'll have two companies where you have you have a high involvement four companies where you have a medium involvement and then four companies where you have a basic involvement so obviously your own resources are limited so you can't have a portfolio of 10 companies all with high involvement there's got to be a sort of balance there but at least you'll know um, you know you've got some sort of off the shelf plan you can roll out uh, and rather than just try and invent everything from from zero, you you know you don't want to be in a position where you you make the investment says oh, okay well let's figure out what we got to do now. That's that's not a great way to start. Much better to start with hitting the ground running by having a plan in place which you can and obviously these three plans you can adapt and customize them to some extent for the company. So a good private equity investor should have a plan and uh, and clearly what's going on now with uh, with covid is that the um, a lot of the plans have been upgraded they've gone from basic to medium from medium to high so you know people are spending a lot more time and longer hours right now because they've had to step up their level of uh, their level of commitment uh, to support the management through the through the current period so some fund managers are working very hard and some 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 may not be but they won't be rewarded later Well, um, let's go on to now on to the question of troubled companies. So we've had a, a very quick discussion about some of the fundamentals, uh, frameworks of value addition in private equity portfolios. So let's let's say a few words about troubled companies, uh, which we should expect there to be in in the current environment. Although still, with two months of data, we still it's still a bit early to talk about companies being in fundamental difficulty because we're still talking about a, a kind of freeze lockdown uh, but as time passes we are probably going to see some troubled companies so let's let's just uh, say a few words about that so let's start by what is the what is the what does insolvency mean and um, before I was a fund manager I've been a fund manager for 20 years before I was a fund manager I worked as a troubled company administrator for four, five years so I was uh, I was an insolvency practitioner and so what does insolvency mean? It means when a company is no longer able to meet its financial commitments. So, for example, the company is no longer able to pay its interest payments or no, no longer able to pay salaries at the end of the month, then it's insolvent. Or if the company is in a process such as administration or, or liquidation, administration uh, would be referred to as, in the UK, is referred to as administration. In the US, that's referred to as Chapter 11, and liquidation is in the UK is, is referred to as receivership. In the US, it's referred to as Chapter 7, and so administration is where the company is still operating but under supervision, and liquidation is when the company basically ceases operations, and its assets are individually liquidated. So it's pretty much the the end of the line for the company. What does uh, restructuring mean? Um, well, restructuring means there is a uh, an arrangement made 
between different stakeholders in the company which allow for a reorganization of its financial structure and organization. Remember the example of Cleantech yesterday, that was a restructuring. And a restructuring process is entered into to try and make the company avoid a formal legal insolvency process such as an administration or bankruptcy procedure. So the restructuring is, is the idea of a restructuring is that it should be an alternative to a, a bankruptcy or administration procedure. So what does it, what does it involve? A restructure it means we, we reach an arra arrangement between the company um, as, as, a, as a legal entity, uh, some and all of its creditors, so, uh, and, and some of the, the other stakeholders. So creditors would mean senior lenders like the bank, it could mean the suppliers, and it could mean employees, employees who are unpaid who have accrued unpaid salaries could all, are, also, are also creditors and the creditors could also involve the government if we're talking about unpaid taxes. So creditors can mean banks, uh, suppliers, employees and, and the government and, and, and others. Um, but it, probably not all the creditors would be involved in the restructuring negotiations. That could get, uh, you know, that could get complicated. And, and the other stakeholders involved would be uh, the shareholders and potentially others such as unions or the local authorities or, or, or others. I remember when I was um, a bankruptcy administrator in Italy, I remember one negotiation where I had uh, a room and I, I was there as the uh, administrator coordinating everything and the parties in, in the meeting that I had the banks, I had the owners, the different owners, I had rep representatives of the employees, I had union members, I had the mayor of the local city, and I had the local police chief, and I also had the local tax office present. So that was a, that was a complicated negotiation. So what are the pri what, what are the prerequisites for doing a restructuring rather than uh, killing off the company or liquidating a company? Firstly, the the underlying business needs to be viable. In other words, the the business mustn't have some fundamental problem like it's making phone boxes. You remember the example yesterday. So the business itself needs to be a viable business which has run into some difficulty but the decline can be uh, reversed. So by viable it means it's a decline that can be reversed. Um, another condition for restructuring is that a sufficient number of the stakeholders need to support the process. You need to get the support of the banks, uh, employees, management, uh, suppliers, shareholders and others, uh, not all of them, but you need to get a, a critical number to support the process for it to go. So that's condition number two. And condition number three is that the company must be able to continue to trade. The company must be able to continue to function. So continue to pay salaries, continue to sell goods or services to customers, continue to acquire materials from suppliers. So it must continue to trade. It must not stop. Uh, trading. If a company has stopped operations, it's more problematic. Uh, and we're going to be seeing that this year because uh, if a company, for example, like an airline just stops for a couple of months, it's one thing, it's like a freeze, but you know, if they actually cease trading, that's a different story. Because if a company ceases trading, the people involved with the company disappear. The employees disappear, the suppliers disappear, the assets disappear, and then the company can't restart again. Uh, and then finally, the other stakeholders must be able to work with the management and when I say management, I mean either the management um, uh, themselves or the management under the supervision of a trustee, such as when I was a trustee, I, I, my job was to supervise management. So the management uh, in, in many restructures would not be operating autonomously. They would be under the guidance of a, an administrator who would who'd be appointed for that specific purpose. So what, would we, what, what are the options for restructuring? And how can we implement it? Well, some of the options might be, um, you know, just the restructuring of companies' operations. So we managed to, you know, re reorganize the factory, the production, restructure the operations, perhaps, um, um, you know, let some people go. Another, another option might be refinancing. So uh, we, uh, we find another uh, provider of, of debt finance who refinances the existing creditors. Another could be, uh, a debt reduction, so a so-called haircut, so um, the banks uh, reduce their debt. It could it could be through a haircut, it could be through a debt equity swap, 
or something like that. And then the final, the final, the final option, if things are not consensual, in other words, if the the banks, the management, the shareholders, the employees, and others can't agree among themselves on a restructuring plan, we may we may move on to a non-consensual restructuring plan, which is imposed by the administrator uh, without the consent of the others, or rather, is decided by the administrator. And then the others are simply told what the plan is, and they have to accept it because it's legally binding. So th those are some of the thoughts about what's involved in a restructuring. And as you can imagine, it's not, um, it's a difficult and it's a challenging process. It's not, it's not an easy, an easy thing to do. Um, I, I did that for, uh, I did that job for five years. It, it's, it is a, a highly uh, stressful uh, job do, doing this. So this brings us on to um, a few thoughts about where we stand uh, today in 2020 with um, private equity portfolio companies, what's, what's going on at the moment um, with existing portfolio companies. Well, we're, uh, in the last two months, uh, most of the uh, companies and, and the, the, the fund managers backing them have been uh, engaged in a lot of stress testing of their portfolios. In other words, uh, saying to the companies, look, uh, run a financial model, and see what the effect is if your sales fall 30%, what the effect is if your sales fall 50%. So they're doing sort of what-if scenarios, like a stress, stress test that, that a bank would run on their credit, credit on their loan portfolio, but on their regular, on regular companies, doing stress testing to see what, 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 the, what the company can resist. So we're still at, not at the point where the scenario is stable enough that uh, the, the fund managers are asking their portfolio companies to do to, to, to redo, redo their, their forecasts and budgets, budgets because it's still too uncertain to be able to do that. So we're more still in a stress testing phase of scenarios rather than uh, formulating new forecasts upon which decisions are going to be made. It's still, it's still too soon for that. And I think that's not going to happen until after the summer. Um, so that's in terms of the financial analysis and the modeling that's going on with portfolio companies right now. What is going on in terms of managerial actions that are taking place in the portfolio companies? Well, um, the main actions are threefold, I would say. The first one is staff protection. So the private equity owners are making sure that the company's staff are safe and secure through homeworking and, and, and making sure there's a compliance with all the necessary health guidelines with respect to the uh, COVID infection and all the rest of it. So staff protection is top of the list. Secondly, liquidity management, so ensuring that the companies have enough cash in order to face their obligations, uh, payroll, suppliers, so making sure the companies are in a, in, a, in a position of liquidity so that they can face their obligations. And then clearly for companies that have private equity backers who have uh, pockets and capital disposal, many, many funds have been providing funds to their, to their portfolio companies, either through capital increases by Y of equity or by loans or some kind of formula like that. But what's important is the fact that the owners of these companies have deep pockets and can help them out in a way that other companies may not. And then thirdly, they're engaged in a supply chain and market impact assessment. So supply chain means, well, what's going on with our supply chain? You know, our suppliers uh, are suppliers trying to get tighter payment conditions our customers unable to pay us. So what is what is going on with our supply chain? Is there anything we can do to manage it? Should we be dropping some customers or suppliers? So supply chain management. And the other thing that's going on is market impact assessment. So looking at the, the markets they're in and what market segments are, some that they may may, may prove difficult or may they maybe they've they've simply lost the market segments. And so that's all those are those are some of the main priorities that the companies are dealing with now, so staff protection, liquidity management, supply chain, and market impact in, in, in assessment. And that's been going on uh, for, for a fair while, uh, since, uh, since February or March, and, and I'm expecting that to continue right through to the end of June. Uh, and, and then probably, you know, once we get through to the other side of, uh, of the third quarter, post the, the, the June results, we're going to see some movement into more medium-term actions, but we're still we're still right here in, in, in a series of short-term actions and gathering data. So that's the phase we're in right now 
with the portfolio uh, companies. Um, a few further things, what, what's going on uh, uh, from the GPs is cash injection. Um, and we should also we should also bear in mind that uh, a number of GPs who are buying back debt, so some of the big buyout funds have been engaged in buying the debt of some of the quite leveraged companies and buying this debt off other debt holders at a discount. Now that is not restructuring, that's simply um, a, a, a trade of debt, of, of a company's debt between two willing parties. So it's not, it's not, it's not an actual, this does not represent an actual restructuring. And one of the benefits is that since 2015, many of the, um, the, the loans uh, taken out by buyout companies have not been too tough in terms of the covenants. And so that's, that's coming to benefit them now. And um, I would describe the support given by fund managers to their portfolio companies they can be, it can be best described as operational support rather than restructuring. It's hard to explain the difference, but operational support means something like, um, you know, uh, just helping the management do what they're doing and doing certain interventions to reflect the current crisis. Restructuring is something more radical. It means changing management. It means... Uh, you know, radical, radical uh, measures taken with the company. But I, I think that's not going on right now. And also uh, the skill set uh, on the part of a fund manager to do operational support. I would say that pretty much most fund managers who manage buyout funds or venture funds or growth, uh, you know, 60 to 70% probably have the, the, the skill set to do operational support, particularly those fund managers who've lived through the crisis of 2009 and have certain more experience, restructuring is a different, is a different animal. Um, you know, you need a specialised skill set to do with insolvency, bankruptcy, uh, and dealing with parties. So that's something that uh, most fund managers are, are not going to have. And so we are talking about operational support rather than restructuring. Uh, and then finally, what I, what I would say uh, as my final comment on portfolio companies is that it's probably going to be quite brutal for the weaker companies uh, startups the weaker early stage uh, venture companies because the venture funds are probably going to um, you know if you take the example of a venture fund if you have uh, you're a venture capitalist and you have a portfolio of 10 companies you're fully going to expect even in good times two or three of those to go bankrupt and not make it and you know one or two might make it big and the others something in between so that's, 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 that's the case in normal times, that two or three out of ten of your companies are going to go bankrupt. So you can imagine today, it's going to, what they're going to do is we're going to say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to anticipate that. So we've got our portfolio of ten companies. We've got these three or four companies that are weaker. We're not going to wait around for them to um, kind of uh, melt away. We, we'll kill them now. So there's going to be a triage of the weaker companies and ventures. So I think a lot of the... Um, Startups, particularly the weaker ones with founders who are less experienced, who haven't got any experience of, of surviving uh, difficulties, or who have a slightly more flaky business model, a bit more of a B to C type business model. I think a lot of these startups are going to um, are going to fall down. There's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of early stage companies uh, falling down, particularly the weaker ones. So that's something we should also expect. The, uh, the venture capitalists are going to be more selective, even with their own, even with their own portfolios, um, uh, as well. So that's that's what I expect to happen um, uh, this year with some of the with some of the portfolio companies. It's certainly going to be interesting times in the portfolio companies, but it's also going to be an opportunity for the stronger fund managers to to um, to to come out ahead. Of the uh, of some of the uh, of some of the weaker fund managers. Okay, so. Th